We're going to start off with Director Heron from Bucks County, who's going to talk to you a little bit about his experience with Rapid DNA and local DNA databasing. I think Kevin left the room after he made the presentation go away. Let's see if we can get it. Because, you know, what would a technology forum be if we didn't have technological challenges? There's no clickers. I have one in my hand. So let's get you in presentation mode. Should just be click one and see yeah. what happens. There you go. It's back. Okay. Good morning. Uh, thanks for uh, having me here. My daughter's all excited. I came to Tampa. I said I got to see the airport and a hotel and a building. <laughs> it's just big. I did take a picture of a palm tree and send it to her, so that was something. But uh, thanks very much uh, for having me here. So my name is Fred Herring. I'm the Director of Public Safety for Ben Salem Township. Basically, the Director of Public Safety uh, is equivalent to a police chief. So um, I've been there for about 33 years, 13 years as director. Let me just tell you a little bit about our county so you get a feel for what we're experiencing and why, we, why we're doing this and really what brought us and what brought me here today. So our county, we border Philadelphia on the north side of Philadelphia. Um, and we have about uh, 626,000 as our daytime, as our nighttime residential population, about 1.4 million people during the daytime, during the uh, daytime. Down here is Philadelphia. So you can see Philadelphia borders up here. And New York City is about an hour and 15 minutes on the upper part of our county from the northernmost part of our county. Why is that important? because we're by two major cities, two major number, city number one and city number four or five in the United States. And that brings a lot of transient traffic to us, that brings crime to us, that brings drugs to us. So that's kind of the gist of what we're going to be talking about today, um, a, little, uh, a little bit different attack in law enforcement, a different way of looking at things. We have 39 police departments, we have about 800 sworn. My department's at 104 sworn. It's the ninth largest pen, uh, police department in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has 1,200 police departments. Philadelphia is number one, Pittsburgh is number two, and then there's about seven others until you get to mine. So most of the police departments are very, very small. Most police departments in Pennsylvania has less than 10 officers. And you can see we have the I-95 corridor, which goes from Maine to Miami, which runs right through our community. Also very important, brings a lot of people into our community. Again, you saw that 250,000 people during the daytime. So that's a lot of traffic. I'm home to the second highest grossing casino on the East Coast of the United States is in my municipality. So that brings a lot of traffic there and it brings a lot of issues uh, with us. So I've been doing this for 33 years. Uh, on the street, obviously, I worked narcotics, I did a whole bunch of things. And in, you know, we, we process DNA and we have processed DNA and it goes off to a lab, and you know, our state lab, and sometimes we get stuff back, sometimes we don't get stuff back. Now, labs are fantastic, but our state lab, there's only three labs in Pennsylvania. Philadelphia has a lab, it's only for Philadelphia PD, Allegheny County, which is for Pittsburgh PD, and the other 1,100 plus police departments utilize one lab. So for me, if I was sending a profit crime, even if they even accepted it, you were talking 12 to 18 months before I got results back, if they even accepted it. Sexual assaults, four to six months. So it takes a long time to get DNA back. But that's okay, you know, I, that's just the way we got used to doing business. But we started looking at crimes. What, is, what are police really affected by? And there's 69 major police departments in the country, and they're the ones faced with the homicides and the sexual assaults all the time. That's what they really have to gear for. And that's what our labs are working for. Our labs are working to solve homicides, process homicide scenes, process sexual assault scenes. But if you look at these numbers, these are just Pennsylvania numbers, our part one crimes, our part one crimes, Ben Salem Township, only 4.3% of the Pennsylvania part one crimes are violent for Ben Salem Township. Pennsylvania, only 14% of their part one crimes are violent. And I would, if I extracted Philadelphia and Pittsburgh out of that number, uh, that's going to be very, very low. It's probably going to be around the 4 or 5% that Ben Salem's numbers are. But the property crime, the other crimes they were experiencing, our other major crimes, Ben Salem Township is a 95.7% of our part one crimes that are nonviolent. Those are the crimes that are not being worked. Those are the crimes that are not being worked. 
86% for Pennsylvania. Those are the crimes that are not being worked aggressively. Well, this isn't law enforcement 101. Well, I'm not here to teach law enforcement 101. But we all know people don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to kill someone today. It starts off with lower crime. This is basic criminology 101 that we've all learned, we've all heard, we've all heard presentations on it. People start off with the smaller crimes. But we don't have the time to work those crimes because we're constantly changing the bucket of water, which is constantly fixing the broken pipe. Well, I would surmise to you, if we start going after these crimes, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, if we start going after these local crimes, the theft from vehicle, the small amount of drugs, the large amount of drugs, we're processing kilos, we're processing you know, bags of heroin, we're, we're processing crack vials, we're processing pipes, and you're going to see some of those results and how that's led to the capture of bigger criminals. If we work these smaller crimes, guess what? The labs will eventually help themselves. They won't have to work the larger crimes. They won't have to work those violent part one crimes because we're going to be going after those lower crimes. And that's what a lot of law enforcement doesn't really gear themselves to. They're always worried about the bigger crimes. The labs have to work the bigger crimes. I get it. I get it. They're, 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 they're a government agency. Just because they get busier, they don't get more resources. How many lab people are here? If you get busy, you just call town and ask say, send me more funds? No, I'm just this county. <laughs> or, you call the county government? I'm busy. It's a busy month. Send me more funds. How does that go over? It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You get what you get and make do, and they don't care if crime goes up. It's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. But we found a way to tackle that. Because really, at the end of the day, I work for the, for the people of Bucks County. I work for the people of Ben Salem Township. I'm not worried about the policies in Washington. I'm not worried about the policies in Harrisburg. I've got a job to do, and that's to prevent crime and make sure that tomorrow there's one less, there's one less victim in the world and one less victim in my municipality. You're going to hear that theme over and over again. What are we doing here today? What are we, and I, I, I'm glad I got a, a chance to stop, but we're doing something very interesting. We're taking the word serial at a crime. That's what we're doing. We're taking the word serial at a crime. If we can get this going, and we can get police departments, and it, it boggles my mind why police departments all over the country aren't doing this. If we can get crime off the street at, at ground zero, at Jump Street, at number one crime, we take the word, we stop serial burglars, we stop serial robbers, we stop serial rapists, we stop serial killers. This is what we're doing here. We're taking the word serial out of crime. So how did we get here? I'm not going to talk about so much local databasing because they cut my time down. Um, but we started with the concept, and he's going to be on the panel. The guy that kind of gave me this idea is going to be here this afternoon, Chris Aspen. In 2009, we actually met with Mike Garvey, who you're going to hear from later. And we started looking at local databasing. We did that by sent, I sent a couple of guys down to Florida, Melbourne, uh, uh, Palm Bay, those municipalities were doing local databasing. <coughs> I had no idea. I could barely spell DNA, but we, that was a joke. <laughs> oh boy, the sun's getting to you guys, huh? Come to, come to Philadelphia for a couple of months at this time of year. You'll love it. Um, and in 2010, we started with local databasing. 2014, 16 departments in our county came on board. And in June 1st of 2015, all 39 police departments started with local databasing. And in March of 2017, I was introduced to the rapid machine. And I'm like, eh, I don't know. So we're doing it now in 30 days. What do I need to do it in 90 minutes for? Uh, you know, when they get down to 60 minutes, give me a call. It's like seven minute ad, six, six minute ad. That's for a movie, so you young to know that. I'm like, let's give it a shot. Let's give it a shot. And we started, and the results were amazing. And you can hear the results in a few minutes. You're going to see that red over and over again. <laughs> DNA every day for us. Every crime scene gets processed for DNA. We process touch DNA. It goes to our it goes to our, our private our private lab that that, that we that we uh, that we send that we fund, and we get 30 day turnaround on uh, on on touch DNA. Everybody that we arrest, and I'll get into that in a little bit, because Pennsylvania is a convicted felon state. Far as an arrestee state, we are not. So we're not taking DNA until time of conviction for a felon in Pennsylvania. I think they've changed over now to some convictions of misdemeanors. Is that right, Lisa? I think some convictions of, of misdemeanors. But it's conviction. It's people that are in jail already. That's not doing me any good. Remember what I just told you three minutes ago. My job, your job, whether you're in the lab or whether you're a boss or you're, you're a patrol officer or a crime scene unit, we have the same job. At the end of the day, we, when we cut through all the nonsense at our, at our at work, we have one job. One job, one job only. 
and that is to make sure that in five minutes from now, there's one less victim in our community. That's our job. Everybody in this room, that's your job at the end of the day. It's just we do different things to get there. So I have about 20 detectives and supervisors trained in rapid. It's pretty cop-proof, which means cops really can't <laughs> screw it up. If something's cop-proof, then a five-year-old can work it. It's fairly cop-proof, but still being cop-proof, I still right now have supervisors, some of my supervisors, and uh, my detectives are all trained in utilizing the rabbit. You're going to hear this. It's an investigative tool. We're not being heard by the Supreme Court tomorrow, lad, folks. It's an investigative tool. It's an investigative tool. It points us to a bad guy or gal. That's all it does, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, a lot of this is leading to blind hits, hits that we have, we, we have no clues on. Just yesterday, I'm boarding the plane, I'm on a, a group thread, anything with DNA they know I want to know about. They lock up a guy for stealing from a car. Pennsylvania, it's a misdemeanor crime. He ain't going to jail for that. Swab his mouth, put him in the rapid ID. 90 minutes later, he hit to a 2012 burglary. That's a clearance of a burglary, and we got a, a burglar off the street. Now, I'm sure he's hit on other burglaries. We just might not have processed the scene, or maybe another municipalities or jurisdictions. But he don't do just crime in 2012 and decide in 2019 he's going to do crime again. I'm sure he has committed crime along the way. So if everybody was doing it, DNA, we'd be clearing a lot of jobs and piling up those charges. And what do I, I don't really care about sending him to jail. I just want to make sure that he's not around him. But wherever he goes, I could care less. I just want to make sure he's not around tomorrow and make somebody else feel horrible when they come home from work, that their house has been ransacked and their personal items have been gone through and their great-great-grandfather's watch has been stolen. I use that because that happened to me when I lived in a juris jurisdiction. I, my great-grandfather's watch was stolen. It wasn't worth anything, but it was a very sentimental to me. So that's what we want to do. So, you know, that was just kind of an interesting case, and this happens every single day. We're going to talk about a lot more cases in a little bit. Pennsylvania is a convicted found state, so we get consent. All right, I'm going to talk about that in a few seconds. 95% of the people that we come in contact, that we ask them for their DNA, they give us their DNA. Thank God criminals are stupid. Or we all have trouble. Why do they give you, and we're in, we're in Florida, so you're probably getting some large drug uh, you know, arrest. Why does someone with seven kilos in the back of their trunk give you consent to search their car? I don't know. But until nine people in Washington tell me to stop asking for consent, we're going to keep doing it. They give us their DNA. Why? It's Fred Harris theory. Criminals watch TV the way we watch TV. They see all the crime shows. They think DNA, homicide, and sexual assault. And I, I'm just a burglar. I'm just a robber. I didn't kill no one, and I didn't sexually assault anyone. So I'm just going to give the cops my DNA because I didn't do any of the crimes I know they're looking for. Guess what? I'm not looking for that crime. I mean, I am, but I'm, I'm looking for the burglaries that happen every day. I'm looking for the robberies. I'm looking for the theft of the vehicle. So the folks give us their DNA, 95% of it. Um, and this is what, we're, this is what we, uh, we read to them. A couple of people left after the, the, the ribbon cutting, but they said, um, you know, they asked me if it's ever been challenged. We had one challenge in court, the judge of help for us. Um, suppression issue, the judge of help for us because of this and what I'm about to tell you. So this is our waiver form. I freely and voluntarily consent to provide a DNA swab to be used for the purposes of criminal investigations. I've been advised that I have the right to, to refuse permission to obtain the sample at any time. I've also been advised that if I provide a sample, I may have it removed from the database upon request. You could call us the next day. You wake up in the morning and say, what did I do? We'll take your DNA out. Even if you, if you gave it to us in a bucket swab for the rabbit, we'll pull it right out. We put, why? Because I don't want anybody challenging what we're doing. we got a good thing going here. The good thing about criminals, you get them tomorrow. You get them the next day. So don't challenge. Don't, don't trick them. Don't do it surreptitiously. Don't, don't, you know, don't threaten them. So we're very, very careful. If I do refuse, I know an officer may apply for a search warrant or court order prior to obtaining the samples. I know that any evidence seized may be used against me in a criminal prosecution. We're not Jerry Springer. You are the father. That's not what we're doing. That was a joke, too. <laughs> oh, boy. I cannot work under these conditions. Um, by the way... I don't get, I don't, they don't make me put that thing up anymore. I don't, I don't work for Thermo Fisher. I don't get paid by Thermo Fisher. I do it because since I've been 12 years old, this is what I wanted to do, is fight crime and lock up bad guys and prevent victims. And I believe in this so much, this, this concept, this product, this initiative, this philosophy, this way of policing, whatever you want to call it, 
it, it, that's why I do it. Um, because if, if, if Tampa, or whether you're in Seattle, Washington, or Albany, New York, or wherever we are, or, or if they do this, it's less criminals, it's less victims, and that's really what we want to do. So we let them swab their own mouth, they read this, we read this, they sign it, it's all on video. You can't say we forced you. We can't say, now, yes, yeah, a lot of people, ACLU types, say, oh, just the mere presence of the uniform, it, it, it takes away the consent. Okay, that's not my problem. You know, that's a, then what do you want me to do? Change it in pajamas? I mean, that's not my problem. I shouldn't give them that idea. They probably say, yeah, it's not a bad idea. Can you put a little pink thing with fuzzy tail on the back? No. This is what we have in our database so far. We have about 33,000 profiles. Almost there. 15.5 reference, 17.5 evidence. We're running out, you know, it's the same criminals over and over again. So we're going to start seeing that number get spread uh, further apart. The reference samples are going to stay or get a little higher, but the evidence are going to keep growing and growing and growing. Um, you can see rapid, we've had about 90 leads so far. It's probably a little bit higher than that, but we're, I'm, I'm losing track of it because when we first started doing it, we're like, oh, this is really cool. Now it's just, we're expected. Like, how come the machine ain't working today? You know, I mean, it always works, but how come we're not getting a hit today? So we kind of expected it. It became a way of life for us. It's played a role in over 1,050 criminal investigations. Uh, any deputy chiefs, chiefs in the room? Lieutenants? Okay. Sergeants? <laughs> All right. Oh. <laughs> your, your ace, your best cop on your squad, on your team. How many felony arrests is he or she going to give you? I don't know what that number is. Somebody normally numbers 35 to 50 in a year. You know, good felony jobs they're going to make. They have an NYPD, though. The best detective you got. It's going to be in a year, 100. All right, so there you go, 100. But even at 100, and that's probably not every detective in New York. No. But even your ace, think of what that costs you to street that cop. Think of what it costs you to do this kind of business. You're getting a, a good deal. Now, putting cops on the street is always going to be priority one. Never are we going to get away from that. But what you get from this is just unbelievable. Again, you know, we started looking at property crime, but it hits the narcotics and other violent crimes. So we're getting, getting guns, DNA off of guns, things like that. All right, let's get into really why we're here. We're going to do some cases. We've seen a 42% reduction in burglary. In the first uh, couple of years that we were doing local databasing, and then again now with Rapid, a 42% reduction in burglary, where before the county was doing it, they only saw 14%. The national average was 4.5%. Now, I'm on a lot of panels. A lot of uh, panels, there's, there's people for this, of course, there's people against what we're doing. And, uh, oh, Karen's playing with the numbers. Crime is down. Burglaries are down across the country. That's why I put this. Yeah, that's true. 4.5% they're down, burglaries. Well, what number do you want? 4.5 or 42%? I'll take the 42% any day of the week. So we're seeing some incredible, incredible numbers. The year following, another 65% reduction in burglary, a 51% reduction in robbery, a 46% reduction in auto theft. A 46% reduction in auto theft. Then in 2018, another 26%, another 26% reduction in burglary, and you can see the numbers, 14% reduction. Our total part one crimes are down 16%. Now, uh, what's, uh, what's today, Wednesday? Monday, I meet with my command staff, we go over the weekend and we talk about our numbers. The numbers come out every Monday, crime up, down, blah, blah, blah. We're like level with 2018. From two, and I'm like, guys, we gotta do better. They're like, you know, what, how much better can we do? Uh, I mean, unless we're gonna bring crime down to zero, and then I can tell you what, I'm not gonna be here free for thermo. I'm gonna be on a speaking circuit for 100,000 an hour. If I can bring crime to zero, so goodbye Thermo Fisher, hello money. You know, so if, if I could do that, but we're going to get to a point where we can't do much more. But our numbers are, are crazy. I think we're under 100 burglaries now. Under 100. When we started this project, it was like three, 400 a year. So it's, it's, just, it's just unbelievable, some of the numbers. Now, when Bucks County got on board, they started seeing, remember that 14%? They started seeing a 25% reduction in, uh, in burglary. The surrounding counties and it started seeing a small increase, one or two percent, very small. Some of the surrounding counties, not, there was one that was not a still a decrease. I don't know which one. Very small increase, but it's not not a big deal, one or two percent. But I, I got a twenty-five percent in my whole county. That, that's that's pretty good. That's, that's, we, we got rid of you know one out of every four burglars uh, is stopped. So that's pretty good. So rapid DNA. Ninety minutes. 
search is not three minutes, about an hour, a minute searches, right? And then uh, if if there's a uh, if there's a good profile from the uh, 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 from the instrument, it, it either gives us a profile or doesn't. So I get I was just somewhere else and some folks were talking science folks, and they start talking about you know the percentages of you know the good profile, you know, the full profiles. Of, the, and I, I had to get up and there's a cops are there and they're like, whoa, what do you get? So like 14% of the time it's giving you bad information? No, it gives you nothing. It just doesn't pick up a profile. It, it, there's a mixture, it, there was a problem. What, I'm not a techie, I'm just a cop, I'm not a techie. It, was a, it doesn't say John Smith did the crime when it was really Fred Herring. It just gives you nothing. So it, it, to me, it, it, it's working pretty darn well. It's working pretty darn well. And you're, getting, you're, you're uploading into the, uh, the XML file, goes into our database, Searches real quick, just like it did yesterday, and we got a guy from stealing from a car, hit to a 2012 burglary. It's that simple. It's that simple. It's just an investigative tool. That's all this is, folks. It's a lead. It's where you had nothing before. And it sends you to a direction. But we use it for crime, arrest and prevention. We're going to talk about uh, uh, exoneration, exclusion, elimination, and identification. We're going to talk about all those three uh, these three types of cases uh, in the next few minutes here. So, am I going too fast? No? How many people think I should go faster? No. <laughs> and it's about the lab and law enforcement working together. Um, there's not a lot of lab folks here, but it depends on you know where, where we're talking. I, I just this is not about us not working the lab. You need a lab. You have to work with your lab. It's like, oh, we don't need the lab anymore. No. no. Where did you ever hear in any presentation, you don't need the lab anymore? This does not take away from the lab. This is not in lieu of the lab. This is not cutting lab funding. You need the lab. So we, we swab them out. We put it with two A and B swabs. When we put it into the instrument, we make sure we have another swab that goes to the lab for the reference sample. If it's a forensic sample, if we do not have enough, we do not put it into the instrument. It goes to the lab. Lab is always priority one. Lab is priority one. Lab is priority one. You see the machine upstairs. We're doing uh, cheek swabs, obviously, blood, saliva, cigarette butts, and chewing gum. The job from yesterday was a cigarette butt left at the burglary scene. I don't want to go into the whole case, but it was a cigarette butt left in that burglary scene in 2012, and that's how we hit to them yesterday. So this is, this is the stuff that we're able to do. I just mentioned this. The priority is to the lab. The priority is to the lab. We have never, when we send that B swab to the lab, we have never, ever had a DNA profile from the rapid instrument that differed from the DNA profile obtained by the lab during the confirmation, confirmatory testing. Never. Now, oh, you guys really, the machine really screwed this one up. This is not what we got. Never have we got a different profile or, or different you know, reading from the lab. Let's talk about some cases. That's really what I think you want to hear about. We're just going to go a couple of different cases. These are 11 armed robberies happened, seven in uh, Pennsylvania, four in New Jersey. At one of the jobs, <coughs> the guy is point of gun armed robbery. One of the jobs, he left a sweatshirt behind. That's it. We had no other information. That sweatshirt was processed. We were able to obtain a full male profile, and it sat in our database. June 6th, we had a, this was a, a State Streets Task Force. We had, uh, we worked with the FBI on this. Again, 11 point of gun robberies is a problem. You know, so June 6th, our uh, officer actually is getting ready to meet up with the other officers to go out on the detail that night. He sees the car, the suspect, pull into a convenience store. He's like, oh my God, I can't believe this has happened. Sees it, he takes up surveillance, sees the robbery going down, he calls in on robbery in progress. Anyway, to make a long story short, he winds up shooting a guy uh, in the convenience store. Bad guy lived, they always do. The cop could have got shot in the toe and he would have died, but the bad guy, you know, the bad guy lived. Um, Get his DNA through a search warrant, threw it in the box, in the, in the rapid ID, and it, uh, this other job, the, the one uh, sweatshirt left behind, we didn't really put it together with this, and then just hit to it. So that was a robbery that probably would have, you know, it's part one crime, violent, that would have went probably unsolved. Uh, the guy was not talking, he wouldn't give us consensual DNA, so you have to do the old fashioned way, search warrants. And uh, it hit to that robbery, so we closed out a robbery, and went for 11 armed robberies at the end of the day. So this is a, a pretty good job. This is, don't worry about the boxes, I'll just go by colors. So box uh, red, number one, is a stolen vehicle from another municipality in our county. 
Box number two, orange, the vehicle is recovered in a, in a county park. It's swabbed, DNA, touch DNA on the steering wheel, gear shift, things like that, put into our database. Box number three, we lock up a guy for a stolen vehicle. We bubble swab him and put him into the, uh, in the rapid hit ID, and he hits to the first stolen vehicle. He probably wouldn't say anything to us. We probably wouldn't put the, the two together because they're not even in the same municipality, same county, but it really, it's a stolen vehicle. It's not something we're doing head spins over. You know, it's not something we're going crazy searching for someone. And I'm just being honest. It's not something I would say publicly, maybe. Um, but the box, the machine, the, the rapid hit ID does the work for you. It did the work for you because this guy might not have gone to jail in the green box. He might not have gone to jail for one vehicle for that. But now with two, yeah, he's going to go up for a little bit. And what does that do? Maybe it prevents someone's car from being stolen the next day. Maybe. I'm not a fortune teller. Same thing here. Uh, don't worry about the boxes. Another municipality, guys run out of a grocery store. Retail theft, stealing some stuff from the grocery store, a couple hundred dollars worth of eats or something, drops a bag as he's running. Cop did a good job. He picks up the bag. How many cops would pick up a, a bag from a retail theft and process it? Would your lab process a bag from a stealing from? Probably, we're getting heads shaking in the back, no, they won't process it. So we process the bag, goes into our local database. The bottom box, we lock up a guy for retail theft, buckle swab him, put him in the rapid, he hit to the other job. Now, people steal from stores for what reason? I got prizes for you. Why do people steal? Who said it? <laughs> oh, Mike, you already got one of these. <laughs> Drugs. People steal from drugs. 80% of our crime is drug related. I don't know if you got this one or not. But people don't, uh, people don't steal to pay their electric bill. People don't steal to make their car payments. People steal to get drugs. 80% of my crime is drug related. So that's how people steal it. So he not just stealing from stores. I'm sure he was doing burglaries and other jobs. We maybe just never got him. We, never, we maybe not really got that DNA processed at that scene. I don't know the answer. But now we've got two retail thefts on him. He ain't going away forever, but we'll get him off the street that day. We'll get him off the street for a couple of hours, for a couple of days, rather. Reference sample suspect, uh, two vehicle thefts, hit to a cigarette butt, wire cutters, gator, aid bottle, Mountain Dew bottle, gear shift, and steering wheel, uh, also stolen vehicles out of two municipalities. It's just, once we get the hit, and we sit there and we question them. You know, you know, your DNA hit to these other jobs. Yeah, I know. Criminals confess. I don't know why, they're dumb, but they confess. So we'll take it. I'll take it any day. Reference sample of a burglary vehicle theft. Suspect hit to a crack pipe in a vehicle and blood on the window. Uh, entry, uh, blood on the window on entry point of a home. The reference sample of a vehicle theft. Suspect hit to a beer can in the steering wheel of a stolen vehicle. So you can see cases that from stores. Stolen vehicles. Reference sample of a robbery. Suspect hit to the DNA recovered from the gun. A lot of times they toss their gun. We'll process the gun. We get a guy in custody. Buckle swab him. He winds up hitting the guns. So this is all pretty good stuff. Again, an investigative tool. This is a good job because it involved, it involved Philadelphia, actually. This is a great job by Philadelphia and, and, and my folks. A school was burglarized. Uh, and this was Ben Salem. School was burglarized. Entry was made through the roof. Two center blocks and a skylight were processed for DNA. This is in Ben Salem. Uh, the DNA collected from the evidence developed a full male profile, nothing in our database. So we know he's out there. What do we got? We got an investigative tool right now. We got an investigative lead. During the same time frame, remember, Philadelphia's right to my north. I sit on Philadelphia on numerous fronts. During the same time frame, there were eight additional rooftop burglaries in Philadelphia. Philadelphia police arrested the suspect and charged him with one of the burglaries. I don't know why only one, but that, that's another issue. All right, not a big deal. The suspect was released. Philly PD, they know. It is a lot of they're two different two different district attorneys, two different philosophies. They know, hey, call Ben Salem, we can get this guy launched. You know, the suspect was released on bail, but he gave us his DNA sample before he released. He hit to our job. He hit to our rooftop burglaries, um, and he went to prison. So this is uh, nine or ten burglaries that this guy did, and now he's going to jail. Where he might not sit in jail, oh, he's got bigger fish to fry. You know, I mean, Boston County's got fish to fry too, but we'll take the sunnies and the little trout and everything else. We'll take everything. And, and if we can stop crime, we're going to do it. So this guy went to jail. I don't know what his status is now, but it certainly stopped him from committing burglaries that night. 
that night he was done committing burglaries. And you could see just over and over again, I don't want to read all these jobs to you, oh, is that two more I want to talk about, an investigative tool, an investigative tool. 69-year-old woman was raped. Very credible. John Smith raped me. I know it was John Smith. John Smith, uh, he was in my house. He lives in my complex. His girlfriend lives here. Uh, he, my husband just died. He came in to talk to me, console me. We had coffee. And then he took me in the bedroom and he raped me on my bed. John Smith has no alibi. John Smith's on video in the area. John Smith's a convicted sex offender. Uh, that testimony alone in Bucks County, you're probably going away. John Smith's a criminal. But he always, at the end of the day when he got caught, he always said, yeah, I did it. Even the sexual assaults, the prior said, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. The old lady's crazy. The old lady's nuts, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. John Smith goes to jail. I didn't do it. We process the coffee cup. Now, this is, uh, this rap is fairly new for us, I think, when this job happened. Maybe a year. Um, we get a rush on the, on the rape kit. Our son is an FBI agent. Pulls for strings, we get the rape kit processed very quick. Uh, he's put into, uh, you know, into CODIS because it, it's, it's uh, and, uh, that, that, no, just the process. It got, did not get put into CODIS for whatever reason, I, I don't know. Um, we, we swabbed the guy after we got the profile back. Um, wasn't him. He was innocent. Take a long story short, she wound up accusing two other guys and we're like, well, we're not falling for that. This guy was in jail. We had to get him out of jail. So it's not just about locking up bad guys. We also exonerate people. And this is a great case of exoneration. Without DNA, this guy would have definitely went to jail. This actually case just finished last week. Quadruple homicide. We had a, a guy who was one of our lovely residents. Um, he, in the summer of 2017, he lured four boys to buying drugs, a drug issue. Uh, he kills them. Kid's crazy. Kills them. Parents have a farm, uh, not in my town. There are no farms, but further up county, about 45 minutes away. Takes the boys up there. He buries three bodies in one grave and buries the fourth body mm -hmm. a half mile away on the farm, or a quarter mile away on the farm. Burns them, beats them, uh, beats them with the back of a boat. Uh, 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 what do you call it? Backhoe, thank you. Yeah, backhoe. Um, there's blood left on the, uh, on the barn floor. Other stuff took us to that barn, but we have no idea where the bodies are. We don't even know if the bodies were there. We find the blood. We get uh, toothbrushes from uh, the guy's house, the, the boy's houses, and we're able to put the one boy, was, that's his blood on the barn, that's his blood on the backhoe, so we're now, no, we've got a crime scene here. To make uh, a long story short, we wind up finding three of the boys, very burned, beaten, but the one body we don't have. All parents, the DAs, this is going on four or five days now in this case. The DAs, it's on with the parents, the prosecutor, and he's like, I, I can't, I can't tell, you know, we can't identify these bodies. I can't tell three parents, we don't know who's who. So it's like, you know, one is not gonna know who their kid is. So we wind up again in the coroner's office processing the four boys with a buckle swab, putting it in the wrapping machine, and we've identified who all of them, who, who they all were. So what is that value to us? It's closure for a family. Most important thing in a crime scene. Closure for a family, some finality. Donardo pled guilty, his, his cousin who was, uh, just got found uh, guilty of first degree homicide uh, in one of the deaths, I think manslaughter, or second degree in the other death. So he took a trial and he lost, and he just got like, uh, like what do I got? Five? Two minutes. Well, I'm going to skip this guy. So, some myths about rapid in DNA uh, because we're racial profiling. We're picking out, you know, I get DNA from everybody. I ask everybody. If a cop doesn't ask that person for DNA, everybody will be arrested. If a cop doesn't ask that person, they got to explain why. Why, did, why didn't you get it? Normally, they write in the report, refuse. Okay, it's good enough. But you see the same cop over and over again refusing, he's just, or she's being lazy. So we want to see what's going on because we know the crime, the, the crime numbers are, are good. So we want to make sure we're doing this as best as possible. 
We're not getting genetic information. This is all stuff you guys know. People think we can you know, see who your Aunt Nellie is and all this crazy stuff. That's Now, that world is changing, right? That world is starting to change with genetics, uh, uh, with genealogy rather. But right now, we're not doing that. We're not making a hit list of people, you know, bad guys in town we want to get. We're not obtaining it surreptitiously. You can, legally, you can obtain it surreptitiously. We don't do that. I, I, I worry about police departments taking it surreptitiously. I just worry about that because I don't want anybody, overzealous cop, to go too far. And then we got what you do in Florida affects me in Pennsylvania. So I, I prefer we don't take it surreptitiously. We do not up north. We don't obtain it by coercion, and it's just an investigative tool. This young lady, this is her picture before addiction, her picture, booking picture. She uh, graduated of Wharton School of Business. She worked for a Fortune 500 company, got same old story, got into some sort of accident, got hooked on opioids, got dependent, lost her job, got in with the wrong guy. I believe she was trafficked. She said no, I believe she was. We arrest her coming out of it. She did 12 burglaries of a pizza. She did, they were burglarizing pizza shops. They were leaving their money in the, in the back. I don't know. We got her blood coming out. We got her on another job. We, uh, we buckle swabbed her, and she hit to all these jobs. Um, or some of them, anyway, they confessed. She just wrote a book and thanked Ben Salem Police and her book for <coughs> saving her life. She really should be thanking you guys, lab, and because I don't know anything about DNA. You know, it's DNA is what brought her to justice, which got her clean. She just got remarried, had another baby. She will never work for a Fortune 500 company again. She's got 33 felony convictions, what she wound up with. But she does consulting, so that's how she gets around that. She'll never work for a company again. But she's got a, she's doing pretty good, Sarah. And I just think it's, a, it's important, because I said about 30 minutes ago, this is what it's all about. It's about preventing victims. And she was a victim. There's no doubt about it. She was a burglar, but she was also a victim. She was also a victim of the opioid issue. She was a victim of human trafficking. She was a victim uh, of what's going on right now in our society. The drugs are just, you know, killing us. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Bill Bratton fan. I'm from New York City originally, uh, born and raised. And uh, Bratton makes this, uh, Bratton was the commissioner in New York City twice. Bratton makes this statement. Knowing your sound will be called as a lot less company to a citizen and the confidence they won't be attacked in the first place. What does it mean? It's okay. People, oh, I locked up the person that broke into your house. Did you get back my watch? Oh, no, no, we didn't get your watch back. That, that was gone 10 minutes and they broke into your house. Oh, oh, by the way, you got to go to court on this day, on that day, on this day, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they wish they would never burglarize, is what they wished at the end of the day. And then so many other crimes. Burglary, robbery, armed robbery, assault, sexual assault, I can't imagine. And certainly homicide. These are things we can't get back, especially the latter two. The last two. So, folks, this is just an investigative tool. It's just an investigative tool. This is not, we're not going to the U.S. Supreme Court to, to put our DNA on for nine justices to look at and read profiles and all that. It's just a lead. Anybody from the U.S. Attorney's Office here? How many people have dealt with the U.S. Attorney's Office? Right? They want it. At time of rest, they're ready to go to Supreme Court. I mean, come on, like do your freaking job. Let's lock some up some bad guys and prevent crime. But the U.S. Attorney's Office doesn't quite work that way. This is kind of what I'm thinking of. It's just a tool. It's just a tool. We don't have to be ready for the U.S. Supreme Court when we're done with a case here. Take the serial out of crime. That's really what we want to do. Uh, I'll be. I think I'm back again later. Thank you very much. I know I went five minutes over, but. This time, uh, give me the full time on the lot.